Hello everyone, welcome back and thank you for joining me once more. My name is Hijack and I'll be your host for the duration of this tutorial. Today I'm going to show you the various steps it took to create version 1.0 of the Dropbox music video. If you have not seen the Dropbox video yet, I suggest you go ahead and watch it first before proceeding with this tutorial. There is a direct link to it available in the description. Included in the description are the Dropbox 1.0 project files for both Modulate and Mad Mapper, intended for educational purposes. Feel free to use and dig through these files as you please. Before beginning, I must warn this video tutorial is intended for people who have used live visual performance software before. This is not an extreme beginner's tutorial, but it should be clear enough to be picked up by any beginner as well. With that said and done, let's get started. First off, a small description of the main laptop making it happen. This particular project was run on a MacBook Pro version 8.3 or 8.3 with an Intel Core i7 processor at 2.5 GHz, 16GB of RAM, and a 1GB AMD Radeon graphics card, a 240GB solid state drive as the main hard drive, and a 750GB hard drive as a secondary drive. Now, as you can see it's a pretty decked out MacBook Pro and I assure you it needs every little bit of speed and power to run smoothly. Next, a description of the whole hardware setup. There's the main laptop, which we're going to be calling Laptop A, where all the action is happening. Connected to it, there's a MIDI controller set to control the software running our video. There is also an on-the-fly DVD recorder set to receive the audio-video output signal from the video software. This is done so that recording can occur outside the laptop, dedicating our RAM only to our video software. Beside it we have yet another laptop which we're going to call Laptop B. Now Laptop B is in charge of playing the music and setting the audio feed to Laptop A, so that Laptop A isn't forced to use more RAM than it should. At the same time, Laptop B and Laptop A are both connected over Cat5, the local area network cable or LAN cable, allowing Laptop B to capture a screen share of what's happening on Laptop A's main screen. This capture is somewhat laggy and choppy, so it isn't very useful for VJ, but it's definitely useful for tutorials like this. Next, time to describe what's going on with the whole software. Setup. Okay, so there are four pieces of software currently running on Laptop A. That is Modulate, Mad Mapper, Mad Equalizer, and Mad Doubler. Let's begin with Modulate. Okay, so this is a screenshot of the Modulate layout running the project file. As it can be apparently clear, the modular nature of Modulate makes it seem like a lot is going on. Not to worry, only a small portion of the tools on screen were used to make the Dropbox. All the tools can be found in the basic Modulate package and via download through the online public module library where you can download and upload modules made by yourself and thousands of other people around the globe. To access it, simply click modules at the top of the screen and then click online library. The repertoire is enormous and extremely useful. Let's take a closer look at the actual tools involved in this specific video. First, the tools that come with the basic Modulate package. Here's a layer set where there are currently 10 layers each with a slider and each running a separately assigned piece of footage. As you can see, only 8 are active in this screenshot. Later on you will see all 10 layers active and running simultaneously during most of the production. Here's the video output preview window, where all the footage is spread out and displayed separately. The current output uses an aspect ratio of 2 to 1, which means it is exactly twice as wide as it is high. Its dimensions are 2160 by 1080 and it is split up into 10 different sections, each corresponding to a different layer on the layer set. With this shape and these dimensions, it is easy to generate footage for simple geometric tricks. Here's how the footage is spread out. There is a one-to-one -one square piece of footage here, another one here, and two smaller ones here and here. Next, one large two-to-one rectangular piece of footage here, another large rectangular one here on its side, and two more smaller ones on their side here and here. Here there is another small two-to-one piece of footage, but its opacity is set to react to sound. And last but not least, another larger rectangular piece of footage here, underneath the first piece, whose opacity is also set to be sound reactive, mixing in only when the sound demands it. And that is all the footage set to the 10 layers. This is then broadcast to Mad Doubler using Siphon so it can then be delivered to Mad Mapper. To do this, simply click on Output at the top of your screen and click on Siphon. Here's the transformer, used to tile each layer's footage multiple times on 2-3 to three dimensions. Here's the movie in and out selection, to control the beginning and ending points of our layer's footage. 
This tool will change the color of our footage by removing red, green, or blue from the original color. This is our master alpha channel, where we can control the opacity of the entire composition or cause a full blackout. Here are our sound input and output levels to regulate the amount of sound coming in from your microphones or audio input and going to your speaker. Now, the tools downloaded from the online module library. Remember, to access it, just click modules at the top of the screen and then click online library. Here is the global beat per minute control, telling the rest of the software the current beats per minute of the song. This can be synchronized to a MIDI clock or it can be tapped and set by the user. Here is the beat router for the layers. Its job is to see the current beats per minute from the global beat control and use that information to animate layer controls and modulate its interface in various ways. For example, it is currently set to control the movie in position and the colors of our layer over time. To set it up, simply click on pick Click on the tool that needs animating and then click on play. The tool should come to life, match to the beat. This tool does the same job as the one above it, but it is instead designed to work with the master controls, like the alpha channel or the main sound level controls, not the layers. Here are the sound routing tools. These are similar to the previously mentioned beat matching tool, but their job instead is to make the controls sound reactive. That's right, they are designed to animate anything on Modulate's basic interface to the volume of the music. Their workflow is also similar in fashion to the beat matching tool. To use, simply click on the pick button, click on the desired slider or knob, and then click on start. The controls will come to life animated by the incoming sound. In this screenshot, the currently selected layer does not have it started, but you can see the layer's alpha channel is assigned to the sound router and is ready to go. Below is the same tool but intended for the master controls only, like the master sound level or the master alpha channel. This is extremely handy if you don't know when a break or the end of a song is coming. The best way to understand this process is to see it in action. We'll be getting to that soon. Down here is the G Vibrator. Funny name, effective tool. Pretty much shakes the crap out of your composition on demand and is very self-explanatory. Now, everything I have previously mentioned has an assigned control on the MIDI controller connected to the laptop. Let's move on to Mad Mapper, Mad Equalizer, and Mad Doubler. Okay, so here's a screenshot of the whole mapping shebang. Similar to Modulate, this all seems pretty daunting at first. Not to worry. Let's start small. This is Mad Equalizer. Its job is to listen to the music and create a colorful waveform that reacts to it. Its parameters can be changed to make it more or less detailed. Like Modulate, it too broadcasts its image through Siphon so that Mad Doubler can pick it up and deliver it to Mad Mapper. Now here's Mad Doubler. Its job is to combine two separate Siphon signals into one. I've set up a specific aspect ratio of 4 to 1 with dimensions of 4320 by 1080, which neatly fits both Mad Equalizer and Modulate side by side. The combined signal is then delivered to Mad Mapper, where it can be selected on the left column with a distinct tag Mad Doubler. Once selected, it appears in the input window, where it can be separated into more manageable pieces. As you can see, this project involved a lot of cutting and placing, but it is down to very basic geometry. The whole idea is to use this layout of footage as a sort of UV texture space or wallpaper design space to reference the video and skin up the stage, hopefully being creative at the same time to cause some cool unexpected illusions to happen. This process allows Mad Mapper to calculate the final color mix, allowing Modulate to use less RAM for mixing since it's a 32-bit application and it's limited to only 4 GB. This is the preview output for Mad Mapper, where the real mixing and the illusion of 3D mapping happens. Here's where the cut-up geometry of the footage and the equalizer is placed. It is then stretched into shape and used multiple times as a skin to map out a stage with a projector, or in this case, a virtual canvas or virtual playground. More information about everything that's going on can be gathered by studying the project file. The project file itself should be self-explanatory once you play with it for a while. Like I mentioned earlier, it is easier to understand if it's observed running live. Okay, with all that said and done, let's get down and dirty with the real action. What you're seeing now is the live video recording of the Modulate controls, broadcast over Cat5 from Laptop A to Laptop B. Like mentioned before, this feed is choppy, but it explains with detail all the live process. Synchronized to all the actions taking place is the reference clip of the full published Dropbox 1.0 video. Okay, let's get a close-up of the tools being used right now. We have the live equalizer ready for the music, our first layer active with its opacity at 100%, so a piece of footage is already running before the video has even started, a blacked out preview indicating the master alpha channel slider is at zero, and the sound routing controls letting us know the master alpha control is set to be sound reactive and its animation is set to start with the music. Now as you can see, I'm running only two layers. Both layers are set to beat match, one for the lead and one for the clap. Let's look into the first layer and its transformer controls. 
The values for divisions of X and Y have both been assigned to the same knob on the MIDI controller, making them both identical values at every moment. Watch as the music reaches its peak towards the very first drop. The value is steady and is then quickly dialed all the way down to zero. This also removes the transformation without switching it off. These kinds of simple yet intense synchronized changes are what cause the mind to believe the sound is coming from the visual experience, not the speakers. Manufacturing this illusion is simple and extremely effective. One thing to mention about these 1 to 1 square layers is that they're all set to run through RAM, uncompressed. They need to be processed this way because they are layers dedicated for beat matching. They require so much processing attention that making them run back and forth from the solid state drive using direct to disk methods instead of the RAM would only chug the system further. The rest of the footage in these other layers is not set to be beat matched. Instead, every rectangular layer has a looped piece of footage running at its native speed and native frame rate. Only thing beat matched are color cycles. These layers are perfect to set direct to disk so that the RAM doesn't pay too much attention to them and can direct most of its attention to the beat matched layers instead. Now, watch. As the music reaches its next peak, all the faders are returned to their zero position, leaving only the equalizer to react to the music. As the electric sound begins to rise, slowly more footage is brought in to accompany the equalizer. As more sounds continue to appear, more and more footage is brought in. Notice, I use the knob media map to the transformer controls to change the XY values and increase the number of horizontal lines before bringing in the footage. Now, here I begin to press and hold the G vibrator to shake the whole composition wildly up and down. And now for the highest peak of the song, this extremely crazy ass light shot. This is an open GL glitch, or easter egg. To make it happen, simply press command option shift. As the drop comes close, I bring all the layers down to zero, and leave only the equalizer. Now, as the drop hits, all the layers are pushed back to 100%. Now this might have been the highest peak, but it's not the last one, and it's far from being the end of the song. From there on, I bring the layers in and out using the MIDI controls, playing with them to the beat until the music reaches its final peak. At this point, all the layers are returned to zero, leaving only the equalizer. The XY values for the horizontal lines are increased once more. The footage is reintroduced to accompany the change in music. Now, with the drum, Another layer is reintroduced to enunciate the upcoming ending. Now wait up and don't drop attention just yet. The song might be almost over, but there are still details to find. Now, as the pitch of the lead slowly increases, the transformer knob controlling the horizontal lines is turned all the way up to accompany the change. Right after the change reaches its peak, the values are brought back down and the number of lines is reduced. This process is repeated with every change in pitch until the end of the song.
As you can see, thanks to the initially sound reactive master alpha channel, the entire video simply fades away with the music. This completes the tutorial slash making of the Dropbox 1.0. Please feel free to leave any comments or suggestions below. Also feel free to leave links to your published work because I'd really like to see new artwork, especially using methods, tools, and techniques like the ones used and explained in this tutorial. Once again, thank you for watching and don't forget to like or subscribe to get new updates and videos. Pass the channel.